Today we're talking about the most important audio device in your entire signal chain, yet I'll venture to guess that yours didn't even come with an owner's manual. Consider this video the next best thing. Trust me, you really want to know this stuff. What are we talking about? Let me set the stage. Every signal source you've ever owned, every DAC, every DSP, amplifier, and speaker is only there because of this organic interface we call the ear. And as an audio engineer, a music producer, and a guy who just plain loves music, I think that we should be as tech savvy about our ears as we are about the stuff that we buy for them. They are the world's most common omnidirectional microphones. A brand new set will typically cover a span of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with a dynamic range of around 120 decibels. Believe it or not, your hearing has its own frequency response, which I'm getting ready to cover as there is a sh ton of confusion surrounding it, especially as it relates to flat response. So let's just start with that. Flat frequency response describes a perfect one-to-one -one relationship between the source and the output. Everything is to scale. To put it another way, flat response is to a speaker what a color accurate profile is to a video monitor. It takes no liberties with the input, it simply delivers it, without bias. Let's say that we have a speaker, and that speaker delivers a perfectly flat response. Theoretically, we should be able to set up a measurement microphone directly in front of it and run a frequency sweep, the result of which should give us that nice flat line. So if we're reading 80 decibels at 20 Hz, then we're also reading 80 decibels at 20 kHz and everywhere in between. However, if we replace the measurement microphone with a human listener, that's where things get interesting. Even though in this scenario the acoustic energy emanating from the speaker is perfectly consistent from one frequency to the next, that is not going to be the experience of someone listening to it. As it happens, our hearing is most sensitive around 4 kHz, which sounds like this. It's the second to last note on your standard 88 key piano. I say as a point to a 49 key MIDI controller. You're a genius, B, keep it up. And this sensitivity gradually tapers off from there, forming the response you see here. This is you, literally. And it doesn't end there. That's just what happens around 80 decibels. The unique thing about the response of our hearing is that it changes with volume. Say that we turn our speaker down to produce 60 decibels across the board. A listener will perceive this as a minor decrease in loudness around 4 kHz, and a significant decrease in loudness around the bass and the upper treble region. If you haven't already noticed just messing with the volume knob, the further you turn your music down, the thinner it sounds. Our sensitivity to frequencies at the outer edges of the spectrum drops at a higher rate than it does around the upper mid-range. And the opposite is true when we turn it up. So if we raise our speaker's output to 100 decibels, as you can see there is now less perceived disparity between the highs, the mids, and the lows. So, if we think of these curves as the difference between our hearing and a flat response, their inverse should indicate the correction needed for us to actually experience that flat response with our ears at any given volume level. And there we have the Fletcher Mountain Curves, also known as the Equal Loudness Contours. This is what bridges the gap between what we measure and what we hear. What's more, if you've already had a chance to watch my video entitled Why Do We Turn Our Music Up? You're already familiar with the idea that 120 decibels marks the upper dynamic threshold for human hearing. And fittingly, if you search for the Fletcher Monson curves online, you'll find that 120 decibels or so is the limit beyond which no sensory distinction can reliably be made. It also marks the point of transition between listening to and playing music for reasons outlined in my Connex scale video. Links down below. So where do we apply this knowledge? If you're a serious music listener looking to get into the acoustic headspace of your favorite artists, Nothing short of a studio tour will let you revisit that experience more faithfully than a sonic replica of the speakers used in the professional mastering space. Most modern control rooms will get within plus minus 6 dB of a flat response, which is actually really good, and to achieve this by ear, mixing engineers will periodically turn the music up to where the equal loudness contours begin to resemble that flat line. So if someone tells you that a flat response doesn't sound good, they're probably not listening at a suitable volume. It could also be that they aren't compensating for what happens at the lower volumes as per the Fletcher Mounts and findings. Coming back to our speaker scenario, let's say that we're listening at a time-weighted average of 80 decibels. This is what the speaker should be doing if we want the listener rather than the microphone to register flat response. My final bit of advice on this whole topic is that even with a perfectly tuned set of speakers, certain tracks, indeed certain albums, are bound to sound like crap for the simple fact that they aren't produced well. Garbage in, 
garbage out. But if your speakers are faithful enough to distinguish between the various levels of production quality, you certainly don't want to rely on the poorly produced stuff as your tuning reference because it won't do the rest of your music any justice. So if you found any of this helpful, be sure to rate the video accordingly, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers!